Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan. The United Nations was founded 70 years ago in 1945, and we are today entering its 70th year, a year when the United Nations itself and all its member states are engaging in a bit of introspection about what the international body has accomplished in the seven decades it's been in existence and what its major challenges are as it moves towards the next decade. Joining me to discuss the United Nations, its past, present, and future, Mr. Mogens Lukatoft, President-elect of the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, sir, you are also, of course, a well-known Danish politician. You were Speaker of the Danish Parliament. You are an important leader of the Social Democratic Party, but now you are entering uh, uh, a new phase in your, uh, in your professional life, uh, a challenging one. Welcome to Rajya Sabha TV. Thank you so much. Yes, it is a challenging uh, year for the UN. Uh, hopefully, it's also a very uh, important, in the positive sense of the word, uh, year, a transformative year for the, for the whole world. Uh, first on the agenda, of course, uh, when we take over the presidency uh, mid-September, is that we will have this global summit on uh, sustainable development goals uh, taking place in New York from the uh, 25th to the 27th of September. As, I, uh, as far as I know, there will be more heads of state and government present than ever before 165 are expected to come. It the will Prime be, Minister of India is also planning to be there. He will be there. Right. He told me today when I met with him he will be there, President Obama will be there, President Putin will be there, President Xi Jinping will be there, European leaders, and the whole, th uh, the whole uh, uh, meeting calendar will be opened by the Pope, uh, which has a very strong message, as we all know, about the necessity to fight against climate change. And climate change is among the many different interconnected goals now written in this uh, very interesting and very transformative document that will be accepted, approved by the leaders of heads and state of government. Uh, the, the climate goal is maybe the most urgent of all of them. Right. Uh, b before we go into details about uh, the forthcoming agenda, yeah. uh, might I, uh, President Lukatov, ask you the standard cynical question that, that many people around the world, when they look at the terrible state of affairs internationally, yeah. um, wars, violence, in some cases escalating tension, uh, often in situations involving the big powers, some of them permanent members of the Security Council, mm -hmm. they look at hunger, poverty, uh, infectious diseases that ought to be quite easily combated, but nevertheless taking a toll of human lives. And they ask themselves, uh, what's the use of the UN? What's the relevance of the UN if it's not able to deal with these problems? What's your answer to this very cynical question that's put to you? Well, there are a number of answers, I think. One is, uh, if we didn't have the United Nations, we had to invent it. We never before in human history have we had a universal forum like this, right. uh, where all nations are, uh, are included, can meet, small and big nations and negotiate with each other. We had one aborted effort to do the same during World War I and World War II, the League of Nations, uh, where big powers uh, were excluded or left, and finally it, it collapsed totally. Now we have been able to, over the, last, the past 70 years, to increase the United Nations to a real universality with, with 193 member states, starting with around 50. Now we are four times as many. Uh, we have, uh, of course, limitations in what the United Nations can do when uh, big powers uh, do not agree. That's what we see in the very, very tragic and bloody events in Syria, because Russia and uh, the other uh, permanent members cannot agree on, on the political solution. This uh, 
devastating and and uh, the massive refugee ma uh, movement. half the population of Syria is uprooted internally or externally now, and 200, uh, 30, 40,000 people have lost their lives. So it's terrible, and there are other conflicts as well. Of course, the uh, with uh, the uh, Russian uh, involvement in in the Ukrainian uh, crisis. Uh, there's also difficulties in reaching common, common ground. But, but, but I think uh, we were not maybe too optimistic after the end of the Cold War to think that every global conflict would be handled within the framework of the United Nations. And that we should, of course, be as ambitious as possible in order to bring back those conflicts who are not dealt with. And then remember that th this is a discussion if the glass is half empty or half full, because there are 120,000 uh, uh, people working in international peacekeeping operations, many of them Indians, and doing a, a, a very good job in, in order to, to uh, end or uh, stall uh, ethnic conflicts and so on around the globe. So the United Nations are involved in very many things, and all the sub-organizations the World Food Programme, the UNDP. Whose the accomplishments often go below the radar, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. In a way. Yeah. But, but of course, there are also, uh, uh, with, with the uh, actual acute refugee crisis, there are also uh, shortcomings here because of the appeals from the UNDP or, or and World Food Programme and so on, uh, uh, or the UNHCR, the uh, Refugee Commissioner, are not met sufficiently. Uh, so we have to strengthen the international uh, community in order to act and act quickly in, in, in times of crisis. Right. Uh, does it worry you that the UN is unable to resolve certain conflicts, as you said, because the big powers don't agree? Uh, and when it comes to finding uh, a settlement to uh, a difficult issue, like the Iran nuclear question, for example, all the negotiations happen in a way off campus. The UN isn't involved in that either. So it's bound to raise a question uh, yeah. about uh, yeah. the centrality of the UN as a, as a forum for resolving conflicts over peace and security. I think in a way, the Iranian uh, nuclear agreement was a step uh, towards a stronger position for the UN because all the permanent five uh, plus Germany were present in those negotiations. And I think it raised hope for all of us that even the very complicated conflicts of the broader Middle East could now find uh, a forum for, for common ground, including the regional players there. So uh, I'm a little optimistic on that. I'm uh, somewhat more optimistic on the uh, sustainable development agenda I mentioned at the beginning, because uh, I, I don't think that at any any point of time, the last 70 years, have the UN uh, in formulating the goals and uh, remedies for a sustainable world being more in front, more in advance of much thinking around in member states. Right. But here's a paradox, right? I mean, on the one hand, the forthcoming summit represents, if, we, if you like, uh, it's a reflection of every country or all countries taking the problem of climate change very seriously. Yeah. Uh, but then you also have the record of the last 20 years where countries signed on to various protocols, Kyoto Protocol and so on, yeah. but then balked at implementing their commitments and tried to dial back. Yeah. How do we resolve this problem where, where countries don't want to deliver on their commitments? I think what has happened during the last 20 years, too slow of course, but what has happened is that for all of us, now it's not only an abstract global problem, it's a very uh, nearby local problem. A country like China with their rapidly increasing economy uh, uh, have to realize and has realized uh, that, that uh, this is not only uh, to discuss what we in the West should have done different the past 300 years. It's an urgent problem uh, locally that if you don't change the air quality, if you don't stop the CO2 emissions uh, gradually, uh, you cannot be sure that we are at all able to avoid 
big catastrophes. Right. So how does this, the Sustainable Development Summit that you mentioned, how does it feed into the COP21, uh, into the wider climate change negotiation processes? Are there two entirely separate tracks? No, no, I think they are very integrated uh, as, 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 we, as we realize in September that uh, eradication of poverty, uh, less inequality between nations and inside nations, uh, uh, environmental catastrophes, climate change is all interconnected. Uh, uh, and uh, that means that climate agreement is the first real test okay. on the ability of the world community actually to implement right. the big declarations. And I think we are much, we are not there, but we are much better uh, in, in the preparations and the pledges made by United States, China, European Union, I India uh, before Paris. Right. Uh, uh, those are obviously pledges of limiting their own emissions and so yeah, on, but yeah. uh, it seems to me whether we deal with climate change or other problems of sustainable development, financing is a key problem. Yeah. And re the UN recently organized the Addis Ababa right. uh, meeting on, on financing for development, where the outcome disappointed many people in Africa and the rest of the world. Yeah. The kind of money, kind of sums being committed was not adequate. Uh, there was a certain unwillingness to deal with uh, the instability caused by capital flows and so on. Uh, I, I, again, there I, I came out of Addis Ababa. I was there also okay. more optimistic than than uh, the the, the uh, uh, analysis you just made because, well, we didn't find all the money in Addis. No, but that was not the intention either. What we said was three things: one, uh, the less Develop, the least de developed uh, countries in this world cannot do the necessary uh, sustainable investment without uh, continued obligation for each country to, to uh, give uh, uh, traditional development assistance. And we have to push rich nations to deliver that. But that will only be a minor part of the investment. The trillions and trillions of dollars that has to be invested uh, in, in, in uh, sustainable uh, development infrastructure will have to come second from uh, national governments, also uh, uh, developing nations gov uh, budgets by a much better organized international cooperation against tax evasion and corruption and the evil interconnection between tax evasion and, and corruption. We have to work together on building institutions and international cooperation in order to fight uh, the Grim reality that rich companies and rich people don't pay the taxes where they earn the money. But there was a great, I mean, the, the Western countries were very resistant to the idea of plugging all the loopholes for tax no, evasion, transfer pricing. Not really. I think, uh, I think the sticking point was that, that many developing countries, and maybe rightly so, would better like it to be something handled inside the United Nations organization, where much of the work, but much good work, uh, is already done in the OECD with cooperation, not only with the uh, rich countries in the OECD, but also with the major uh, uh, players outside India, China, South Africa, Brazil, Russia. So we, we made a step forward okay. in this also, but there's a long way to go, I realize that. The third one is, and that's the most important one, we have now, governments have now to define the framework of, 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 of the markets so that it is obvious that green investment is good investment, that there are stable conditions, right. that, that, uh, that uh, carbon investment is bad investment. Right. Uh, and, 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 and that has to do with changing the games of the market uh, by regulations, taxations, whatever. Uh, and that has to do with a very, very promising cooperation that is under a uh, big increase right now with huge progressive parts of uh, international business community. That's what, what, that was the most promising uh, experience I had in Addis. That was to meet with some of the big companies that actually saw the light in this. That money is to be earned 
And the only way to earn money in the long run is by sustainable development, behavior. Uh, now, uh, uh, President Lukatoft, you mentioned in an earlier intervention uh, the comparison between the League of Nations and the UN. Yeah. And one of the factors in the League of Nations not, take, not being successful was that it excluded important powers. There is a perception that many of the failings of the UN, uh, particularly in the peace and security arena, have to do with the fact that the institutional structure of the UN, yeah. particularly the Security Council, reflects a distribution of power that is no longer relevant. Yeah. Uh, important countries like Brazil, India, South Africa, uh, and the developing world in general do not have the kind of voice that they ought to. Uh, the UN General Assembly, uh, there is a complex division of power between the Security Council and the General Assembly, but uh, the General Assembly has an important role to play mm -hmm. in suggesting reform of the Security Council, including its expansion. This has been something that's been talked about for decades. Uh, well, certainly the last 20 years has been so much of, but the discussion has never moved to a concrete stage. How hopeful are you? Uh, we have still a few, couple of weeks of President Kotesa's uh, uh, term as president of the uh, of UNGA, then you take over. How optimistic are you that in this period, there might be something concrete by way of a negotiating, a, a text for negotiation on yeah. Security Council expansion? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. I think President Kutsesa, whose term is ending now in two weeks' time, uh, uh, made an important step in asking the ambassador of Jamaica, uh, Ambassador Ratswai, to make a written analysis on the positions of, the, of uh, uh, all member states, or as many as wanted to express an opinion, on the necessity to change the composition of the Security Council and how to do it. But of course, there are uh, different views on, on, on this, but uh, we took a step on the initiative of President Kutsesa uh, towards a text-based uh, negotiation on, on change, which has never been uh, uh, happening up till now. And it will be up to the outgoing General Assembly to roll over the results of this report uh, to the new one right. and, and for member states uh, to, to take initiatives on that basis. Uh, uh, I cannot predict it. I, can, I cannot decide it. it I, I'm not the one that will make, can make resolutions. It will be member states to do it. But I think that is more of a process than we had before. Right. Uh, just like... Uh, but, uh, and I agree, basically, that uh, when we have passed now 50 years since there was any change in the composition of the Security Council, we have more than doubled the number of members, uh, there is a need to reconsider the whole setup. Absolutely. Uh, just as President Kotesa was able to show initiative in an arena which obviously is to be determined by member states. Yeah. Uh, how much, uh, how far are you prepared to go <laughs> to uh, make this a priority in the sense that, uh, you know, in the past, or even now we've seen discussions about how the Chinese are, certain big powers, particularly China, the United States, are not very uh, supportive of this process of reform. Mm -hmm. Now, it's one thing for the world to accept that they have to live with the veto power mm -hmm. of permanent members in the Security Council. Yeah. But if, under the specious plea of consensus, uh, the same permanent members want to exercise an effective veto over progress in the General Assembly, that would be a travesty, mm. wouldn't it? Yeah. Uh, I, I cannot in any detail say how far I, I could go, because that would be intense consultations between member states to see if there's finally a kind of breakthrough in, 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 in this important area. Uh, I, I think that we have to realize what the rules of the game are. You have to, uh, in, in any change of the charter, you have to have a two-third majority among the 193 uh, member states, and you have to have a ratification right. by two-thirds, including the five, the five permanent present members, yes. uh, permanent members. And, 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 and we all, we can all see that there are complications in right. this, uh, but 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 uh, 
it will, it's high on the agenda of many member states that some change should take place. I mean, the, the as well as <laughs> is it high on the agenda that there should be change in the procedures for selecting the next Secretary General, the one of seven billion as it is present. It's a very important position. The member states ought to be more involved in the presentation and questioning to potential candidates. And, and that, that, that one, I think, for sure is moving. We will have a more open, more transparent process of selecting the next Secretary General, which is a very important personality in the organization uh, than we have ever had before. The, the reason uh, you would have heard a lot during your visit to India about the Security Council I have, yes. and the process, yes. uh, you know, and, and the fact that now we are at an important point is because if uh, a negotiation begins and, and the General Assembly begins to consider concrete, a concrete proposal, uh, there's every likelihood that countries opposed to expansion would continue to be opposed to it. But the political cost to them vetoing an expansion proposal when it's a, a, a finalized proposal which two-thirds of the members agree to is much higher than if they succeed in killing the whole discussion before it starts, uh, which is why it's important from the point of view of India and, and RSA, Brazil, South Africa, uh, indeed the rest of the developing world, that this discussion start and that there be a concrete uh, negotiation-based process. Um, if, if you inherit, uh, I, I mean, I'm not expecting you to give a commitment, but, <laughs> but uh, there's every likelihood that this, will, this baby is going to fall in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, but I think I, I, I will stop arguing around it now because uh, I have to be very careful to, to accept the fact that it is the member state driven process. Uh, but but, but we, we know the limitations, but, 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 but uh, as I said, there is more movement on that scene in real in reality than it has been before. Right. And you mentioned the UN Secretary General uh, position. Yeah. There's a lot of discussion that it's finally time uh, for there to be a woman UN. Yes. yes. Uh, I, w I would have thought that the time was even there in 1945, but uh, <laughs> the fact that 70 years later there is, still hasn't been a woman yeah. uh, as Secretary General, you think there's a good chance that uh, the successor of Mr. Ban Ki-moon will in fact be a woman? Is there a consensus I, I, building up? I, I, I've been uh, meeting with uh, all the regional groups already uh, earlier in spring here, and there was a very strong expression of, of, of that wish that we finally could find uh, the most competent woman to, to be the next Secretary General. Yes? Uh, another irksome issue in, in India when we discuss uh, UN, uh, you know, what the UN could do is the stalemate over the uh, Convention on, on Terrorism. Yeah. The definition, this has been an, an issue that India has flagged for years. Yeah. Uh, is there any prospect for forward movement on that? Uh, I know that the Prime Minister has made this a priority for his government again. Yeah. Uh, what, what prospects are there for this uh, convention to finally be adopted? I cannot tell you for sure. I don't know uh, enough about the positions. What I, what I know and what I have been been explained is that, well, the, the, the basic problem in these long dragged out uh, negotiations for 20 years or something uh, has been the definition of the terrorism as such. But, but that there may be a, uh, an opening in the fact that actually the Security Council have and it has in very many uh, concrete resolutions defined. Uh, we have the 1267 process. Yeah, and, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it should be easier now to reach a kind of consensus on what terrorism is, or what at least terrorism is. Uh, but I am not in, uh, informed enough to, to say to you, yes, now, here, yeah, I don't know. Right. Uh, well, we're out of time, uh, President Lukatov. I've, I've pushed you quite a bit in this interview. Thank you for, I thank you for being a good sport. And thank you, thank you very much for joining us on uh, Rajya Sabha TV. It's been a real pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. That brings uh, to an end this episode of IST. Do join us again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.